Today we're going to be talking about enzymes. Enzymes are biological catalysts. Catalysts are chemicals or molecules that catalyze or uh, make reactions happen faster. Uh, so biological catalysts are mostly proteins and these are chemicals or uh, molecules found inside cells that are causing reactions to happen faster than they would normally. And they happen a lot faster. For example, catalase is um, a enzyme that's found in all cells. Um, it breaks down hydrogen peroxide, which is H2O2. This is um, a byproduct of many metabolic um, reactions and it is poisonous to cells. So most cells have catalase in them and it catalyzes the reaction of uh, hydrogen peroxide down to water and oxygen that are harmless, right? So that's important. And it happens really fast. It happens like 200,000 reactions per second, okay? So enzymes allow all these chemical reactions, all these biochemical reactions that are happening inside cells all the time, it allows them to happen at the speed of light, fast enough in order for life to be as it is, okay? And then an important thing to remember about enzymes as we go through this, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, um, is that they facilitate reactions. That means they cause reactions to happen. They bring together uh, the reactants, um, but they're not changed by the reaction. Okay, so here is a diagra diagram showing a bunch of important stuff about enzymes. Okay, so um, first of all, this is the enzyme, okay? And it has an important site here called the active site. Okay. For an enzyme, the active site is where all the action takes place. That's where the um, substrate or substrates are going to bind and where the chemical reaction will actually be taking place. The substrates are the reactants in the chemical reaction. Okay. So the substrates are going to be acted on upon the enzyme. These substrates fit into the active site, and notice that they fit perfectly into that active site. That's important. Um, and form this thing called the enzyme, enzyme substrate complex. Okay? The enzyme substrate complex only exists for a fraction of a second uh, because these, this reaction is happening so quickly. But it is important. Um, it allows the enzyme to catalyze the reaction by doing things like putting two molecules in pro close proximity to each other that makes it more likely that the reaction would happen, or by bending bonds that need to be broken, for example. Okay, and so then that reaction happens in the active site, and then the products are released. Okay, so the products are what are being produced by the reaction. Okay. And importantly, the enzyme is regenerated um, just as it started. So remember that um, enzymes facilitate or cause the reaction to happen, but they are not directly um, involved in the reaction and they are not changed by the reaction reaction okay, so this means that enzymes can be used over and over and over again okay we're going to talk about it a little more um, soon um, but enzymes are also highly specific that means that every enzyme has just one reaction that it can catalyze okay so if you're an enzyme your life is pretty boring because you are just doing the same thing over and over and over again right you're catalyzing the same reaction catalyzing the same reaction and you're never changed by it. All right, so most enzymes are proteins. Um, and just a reminder from our last lecture um, that proteins have primary structure. That's a sequence of amino acids. And that primary structure leads to tertiary structure. Okay, and that's the overall three-dimensional shape. And then that um, gives the shape of the, prote of the protein. And for enzymes, a lot of the shape that we're thinking about is the active site, okay? So the active site has to have an exact, correct three-dimensional shape, okay? And all that's dictated by the tertiary structure. Um, and it, if it doesn't, then it can't do its job properly, okay? It needs to have a shape that is complementary to the substrate or substrates, okay? So the shape of the active site then allows the enzyme to perform its function or to carry out or catalyze the chemical reaction that it that it can catalyze. Okay. Um, one way to think about it is um, is this lock and key model where the lock and really we're talking about the active site. Okay. The lock is like the active site on the enzyme. Oh, site in there 
that also. And the substrate is like a key, okay? And just like you need to have a specific key to get into your car or to get into your house or what have you, um, and it's the only one that fits and works, so it is true with the enzyme's active site and its substrate, okay? So the substrate is like a key. It has a specific shape that is complementary to the enzyme's active site, okay? And it can go in there and bind. Okay? This is called enzyme specificity um, because if you have a substrate that's not the correct shape, then you won't, would not have it binding, right? So here with this example, um, this would be the active site of the enzyme and this key or this substrate would fit perfectly, but this one wouldn't, right? So um, if you have a substrate that's a different shape, it's not going to fit into the active site and therefore it wouldn't have the um, reaction catalyzed. And so this is called enzyme specificity, the idea that every enzyme has a specific substrate or a couple substrates that it can work on. All right, I'm going to show you this quick video. It doesn't have any sound. So there's the enzyme. There's the substrates. They're going to go into the active site, okay, and then there's the enzyme substrate complex here is what's happening a little more up close. There's the two substrates, and the reaction happened, and there go the products, okay. So that's the idea, and then that enzyme is set to go for the next time. Okay, <laughs> let's talk about a little bit about enzyme nomenclature, and nomenclature is just a fancy word that means naming. Um, so this is how enzymes are named. Enzymes always have um, this ASE ending, or I wouldn't, I guess not always, most of the time have an ASE ending. Um, so if you see the name of a molecule with an ASE ending, then it tells you it's an enzyme. There are some enzymes that don't have the ASE ending, um, so it's not always true. So the ASE ending is a giveaway. And then the other part of the name uh, starts to tell you about what that um, enzyme does. Uh, so, so for example, lactase, which is the enzyme we'll be using in lab, in our enzyme lab, uh, lactase breaks down lactose, which is uh, the sugar that's found in milk. Okay, so that lact here is referring to lactose. Okay, here's a different one. Peptidase um, breaks down peptide bonds in uh, short proteins. Lipase uh, breaks down fats, which are lipids, um, that are found in some of the foods that we eat. And cellulase is an enzyme that breaks down cellulose, which are, is what cell walls are made out of. Made out of. Uh, humans don't have that, so we can't break down cellulose. It just goes through us as fiber. Okay. Um, so that's just uh, how enzymes are named. Okay, now we're going to talk about the two general types of enzyme-mediated reactions. There is basically uh, two types of reactions that you could put every kind of reaction into one of these categories, either a building up reaction or the other one's a breaking down reaction. Okay, first we'll talk about the building up reactions. So this is when molecules are being made, and that is when covalent bonds are being formed. Okay, covalent bonds hold energy in them, and they require energy in order to be made. Okay, so that means these building up reactions um, require energy input in order to occur. Okay? And we call these, another name for that would be calling it an endergonic reaction. Um, ender means in and gonic is referring to energy, so it means energy is going in. Okay? We have looked at these already when we uh, talked about dehydration synthesis reactions that are used to put together the monomers to create um, carbohydrates, uh, proteins, and nucleic acids. So hopefully this will seem familiar to you. So for example, you could take um, two substrates, glucose and fructose, and then use the enzyme sucrose synthase. Okay? Um, note it has the ASE ending, and then it is also telling you what it does. Okay? Synthase uh, refers to synthesis. So there's a group of enzymes that are called synthases, and they all synthesize something. And then this one is even telling you what, it's, what it synthesizes. So sucrose synthase is the enzyme that takes both of those um, substrates into its active site, and the active site fits them exactly, um, and then does the chemical reaction, that, the dehydration synthesis reaction that pulls out water and makes this new bond here. Okay. We also uh, looked at this when we looked at how nucleic acids are formed. So here we have 
to RNA nucleotides okay, and RNA polymerase is the enzyme that will link those together in a dehydration synthesis reaction making this new bond here. Okay. Note this name also tells you a lot about it, right? It's an ASE. It's an ASE ending, so that means that it's an enzyme. And the polymerase part, pol polymer, a, polymer uh, refers to making a polymer. Okay, so it's when linking things together, and this one is telling you that it's making RNA. Okay, the other general type of um, reaction mediated by enzymes, an enzyme-mediated reaction just means that the rea reaction will happen when the enzyme is present, okay? That it happens too slowly without the enzyme in order to, um, you know, support life. Okay, so the other type of enzyme-mediated reaction are breaking down reactions. Okay, these are the opposite of the building up reactions. This is when molecules are being taken apart. You could think of this as digestion. Okay, digestion, when you eat food, um, the enzymes that help you with that are breaking those covalent bonds that are in the molecules that you're eating. Okay? Um, so breaking covalent bonds, because covalent bonds hold energy in them, um, covalent bonds, when they break, sorry, my phone's ringing, <laughs> so annoying. Um, breaking molecules or breaking those covalent bonds releases energy, okay, and these are called exergonic reactions. Exergonic reactions um, release energy, so exer means out, not referring to, you know, away, um, and gonic is referring to energy, okay. And these are the opposite of dehydration synthesis reactions, and we call these hydrolysis reactions, okay. Hydrolysis reaction, you start with some molecule and you want to break a bond, right? So here we want to break that bond and break these back down into their monomers. Water is going to have to go in because just because it's the opposite of dehydration synthesis, in order to break that you're going to need to fill in the gaps with the water molecule. Okay. Sucrase is the enzyme that does that and then it breaks back down into glucose and fructose. So it's the complete opposite of what sucrose synthase does. And here's another one doing the opposite of what RNA polymerase does. This is RNA, RNA li ligase. Um, ligases are enzymes that break things down. Um, and so this one is breaking this bond here. And again, water has to go in in order to restore um, that OH and that hydrogen there. Right? That's where that water is going. I'm drawing some arrows. <laughs> okay. um, so it's doing the opposite of what RNA polymerase did. All right, let's get back to thinking about um, the structure of enzymes and remembering that they're proteins and proteins have primary structure, like I said, leading to tertiary structure, which is the overall, overall three-dimensional shape. Okay, that creates the active site, which then leads to the function. Okay, remember that the shape of the active site is very important, in fact, essential for that enzyme to function properly. The shape of the active site has to fit exactly the shape of the substrate or substrates for which that enzyme is going to care, um, facilitate the reaction. So what happens if you change the tertiary structure? Well, then that would change the shape of the active site, which would then lead to a loss of function or a change in function. Okay. And this whole process is called denaturation. Okay. Uh, this is different than a mutation. Okay. A mutation, um, we look, we talked about that with sickle cell disease and we had a different shape of a protein, of hemoglobin protein, based on a change that started in the primary structure. When we call, talk about denaturation, we're just talking about the loss of three-dimensional structure resulting in the loss of the ability to catalyze reactions oops, uh, caused by a change in environmental conditions. Okay? So the primary structure hasn't been changed, it's not a mutation, um, it's just um, the conditions under which that enzyme is working have changed away from what it's used to. Okay, so let's go back to this slide here. Um, so this is showing uh, what they would call a native enzyme has its uh, correct tertiary structure or its correct shape, okay, and wherever its active site is it would be present and in the correct um, conformation or shape. Okay. You change the um, conditions with, that it's in and we're going to talk about that in just a second, then it can become denatured, or so another way to think of it, it would be unfolded, okay? Um, so notice that the secondary structure is unchanged, the primary structure is unchanged, but it's now come apart, and it's not its correct 
doesn't have its correct tertiary structure anymore, so it's lost its active site. Okay. Therefore, there would not be a place for the substrate to bind, right? There's not a place for the substrate to bind, or if the substrate can't bind very well, then that enzyme can't carry out the, uh, the catal catalysis of the chemical reaction anymore. Okay. So um, let's look at uh, the effect of both temperature and pH changes on enzyme activity. Okay. Um, so this is a general graph, but what this is showing is the reaction rate on this side. The reaction rate is the, the rate or the speed at which an enzyme carries out or catalyzes the chemical reaction. Okay? Um, so this is low, meaning would not be working very fast to more to faster up here. Okay, so increasing reaction rate. And then on the x-axis we have temperature, okay? starting with low temperature and going up to higher temperature. And then what's graphed here is the reaction rate over, over the temperature. Right? Um, so the, this can tell you the effect of the temperature on the reaction rate. Okay. By the way, the temperature is the independent variable and the reaction rate is the dependent variable, right? Because it depends upon the temperature. All right, so let's look at this. So down here um, are low temperatures, okay? And at low temperatures, we see that the reaction rate of the enzyme is quite low, okay? As the temperature increases, the reaction rate slowly climbs. So what's happening there is that um, molecular movement is increasing as the temperature goes up. Okay? At low temperatures, molecules are mo moving slowly. As the temperature increases, they move faster and faster and faster and faster. Okay? That means um, that they're zipping around, um, say in the cell or just in a liquid, faster as you increase the temperature. Okay? Enzymes and their substrates rely on random collisions to come together. So you have to have enough enzymes in there and enough substrates in there um, for them to be zipping around enough to come together. Okay. When the molecules are moving slowly, then it just is going to take longer for the substrate to find the enzyme and, and bind to it. So you get less reactions happening. As the temperature goes up, the molecules move faster and faster, and so there are more collisions between the enzyme and the substrate, and you get a faster reaction rate, okay? And that's why you see this increase here, okay? And it increases up to what is called the optimal temperature, okay? So in all of this, the enzyme is in its native state. It hasn't been denatured. The optimal temperature is the, the temperature where the enzyme works best, okay? Um, so it at some temperature, and it depends for the enzyme. So enzymes um, are a, uh, adapted to work under the conditions where they're normally found. Um, so, you know, for a human being, most of our enzymes are going to work best at body temperature. Okay? But if you're um, a little archaean that lives in a hot spring and you like it 250 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, then that's when you're, where your enzymes are going to work best. So the optimal temperature is not a set temperature. Uh, for all enzymes, it depends on the enzyme that you're talking about. But at the optimal temperature, that's where the reaction rate is the highest, right? So it's working the best, okay? What happens when you increase the temperature past the optimal temperature is that you see this quick decline in reaction rate down to almost zero, okay? And what's happening there is you have denaturation. Okay? And actually the arrow should be pointing to all of this, right? All this area here and all the way down to there, we have the enzyme denatured. Okay, that means it's unfolded and it can't do its job anymore. And so the reaction rate just, you know, declines quickly. Um, and what happens to denature it with the temperature? As the temperature increases and increases, not only is the molecule moving, but the atoms within the molecule are moving around more and more and more. And at a little bit past the, you know, just past the optimal temperature, the internal movement of the enzyme, meaning the um, atoms that are part of the enzyme, start wiggling around too much, and that tertiary structure comes apart. The hydrogen bonds that are holding it together come apart. The hydrophobic interactions that are holding it together come apart. The ionic bonds that are holding it together come apart. Um, the only ones that don't really come apart uh, in uh, when the temperature goes up 
a certain amount are the disulfide bridges. Those ones are very stable because they're covalent bonds. Okay? So therefore, enzymes that are adapted to work at high temperatures have more disulfide bridges. They're held together by those sulfur-sulfur bonds, which makes them more stable at high temperatures. Okay? Um, but most enzymes are going to denature when you get them, you know, say like boiling, for example, that would uh, denature most enzymes because most living organisms live at a temperature lower than that. Okay? So in summary, um, enzyme activity um, at low temperatures is, is low just because everything's moving more slowly. And then past the optimal temperature, the enzyme denatures, it loses its shape because the, um, the, you know, the heat, the molecular movement is pulling it apart. And then you get no enzyme activity. All right, let's look at the same thing for pH, okay? Uh, so this graph is the same, reaction rate going from low to high here, and then this is going from low to high pH, okay? Um, remember with pH, uh, low pH is like 1, and high pH is 14, and middle pH would be 7, okay? And this is acidic down here, and this is basic. And the pH is the measure of the amount of free hydrogen ions. Okay? At a low pH, meaning acidic, there's more hydrogen ions. And at a um, higher pH, meaning more basic, there's fewer hydrogen ions. Okay? And at pH 7, uh, the number of hydrogen ions and OH ions is, is the same. Okay, so this is showing the pH scale. Okay? Um, and we see that we have low level reaction until we get up here and then we have a high level reaction and then we go back to down to having a low reaction. Okay, what's happening at here again is that we have an optimal pH that the enzyme likes to work at. Okay, for humans um, our optimal pH will be around 6 or 7, um, about neutral, and so most of our enzymes would work best at that pH. Um, but this could be shifted down toward the basic end for organisms that can tolerate basic conditions or down towards the more acidic end um, if you're dealing with an organism that can tolerate acidic conditions like there are some archaeans and bacteria that can live in high, uh, sulfuric acid which has a very low pH, is very acidic. Um, so their enzymes would be able to um, accommodate that and their optimal pH would be shifted that way. Um, so at the optimal pH, that's when the enzyme has its perfect um, tertiary structure. Um, the active site is just the right shape for the substrate to come in and bind, and so reactions are happening quickly. Okay? What happens when you move to either side of that is denaturation, right? And the protein becomes unfolded, the enzyme becomes unfolded, and can't do its job anymore. Okay. Um, the reason it becomes unfolded is because of the change in the hydrogen ion concentration, right? So the enzymes are going to fold at a certain pH, and that's going to help form those R group interactions that are holding the protein together or holding the enzyme together, okay? So the hydrophobic interactions, the ionic bonds, the hydrogen bonds, those things are highly affected by the hydrogen ion concentration. So if you take a enzyme that say formed and it works best at pH 7 and you put it at pH 5 or pH 2 or pH 3 or something like that, the number of hydrogen ions is going to be a lot higher, right? And that will disrupt some of the hydrogen bonds and some of the ionic bonds and could even affect the hydrophobic interactions as other molecules are interacting with water differently. Um, and then on the other end of that, and that would be that would then cause that tertiary structure to unfold because you lose those R group interactions that are holding it together. Okay? And the same thing would happen on the other side, except for then you'd have fewer hydrogen ions than you would be used to, um, and that would cause the same problem. You'd have those R group interactions disrupted, and the tertiary structure would start start falling apart. Okay, we're going to look at this in our enzyme lab. So in our enzyme lab, we're going to use lactase. Lactase is the enzyme that um, breaks down lactose into glucose and galactose. Okay, so here's the reaction. This I took just straight from uh, your lab when you built glu uh, glucose and galactose and then put that together to form lactose. Okay, so we're doing the opposite, right? This is what you did in lab. You made galactose and, made, and 
glucose, right? You found people who um, could make lactose with you. Okay, you acted like lactose synthase. You synthesized lactose. In lab this week, we are going to be working with lactase that does the opposite, right? Ta takes lactose, um, does a hydrolysis reaction. and breaks apart that lactose into its component parts, okay? And we're gonna look to see how does temperature uh, and pH changes affect the rate of reaction. And that we'll be exploring in lab.